Welcome back to the Independent Investor Channel. It's great to be with you guys for the weekly update. Absolutely going into the week of earnings. Super important to continue to foot stomp this opportunity. There's no greater opportunity uh, that I see here in the green space with the green initiative, with uh, companies taking hard looks at solutions right now. Um, who is going to be that solution of choice? It's uh, an exciting time to be covering uh, highly on holdings and the progress that's been made here. Uh, I'm not going to mention too much about the stock price. I think all too often the stock market uh, will get it wrong and it, it'll get it wrong uh, in a big, big way. And you look at those things and a lot of people are looking at this $3.15 stock price and they're, they're thinking this is a bad thing. It's only creating opportunity. It's just that simple. It's creating opportunity with the disconnect on uh, that what goings on at the company, which Thomas Healy just dropped a wonderful uh, podcast and interview with Dooner with What the Truck. This week, it was put through, it's put through uh, multiple media outlets. Um, I thought it was one of the best pieces of content that I've seen. There was a lot of things that I picked up in that interview, Thomas Healy talking about not even being able to recognize the company uh, being public here just two short years um, and, and how quickly it's evolved to, to where they are now. Um, the very, very uh, insightful. Uh, it was fun and it, it was engaging. Uh, this is a, a, an amazing, amazing time to be looking at these companies here because there's so many different multifaceted things going on here with the company and what fleets are looking to engage in in looking at the bottom line tco this particular uh video is going to be jumping into what i feel has been a topic of discussion not only in my private uh, whatsapp group but also an amazing piece of due diligence was put through the discord uh, group here, uh, the highly on discord group, which is probably hands down the best public forum uh, in the world uh, on this company, bar none. So if you're interested in this company, or you're just now hearing about it, or you're, you know, you're interested in the space as a whole, um, if not, you should be. Uh, it is super important to be paying attention to these things right now. I will say this about public markets right now. Every, everything's taken a bath. There's not going to be a whole lot of uh, latitude given to companies right now. My earnings expectation are fairly light going into this Q1 2022 uh, with the uh, opportunity for highly to surprise to the upside. Um, they may do that. Do I believe they're going to? No, I don't. My expectations are low. Uh, I'll be uh, adamantly watching the results as they um, as they turn out. I'll be uh, intimately listening uh, for progress that's being made on the um, the market that's highly on stepped into has been just fraught uh, with headwind. And, and I think if I was going to give uh, a scale of one to 10 on the difficulty scale of stepping into this market as a young company that at the time of coming to public markets was pre-revenue. Um, I would say that this is about the most difficult of environments that they could have possibly stepped into. I, I mean, this company is given zero credit for what it's been doing and right now being valued at cash. Uh, it, it, it's obviously being put in a corner uh, as a prove it story. And I, I believe that there is going to be an emergence uh, as this company is able to bridge where we are now to what is uh, been uh, earmarked multiple times uh, by the CEO, Thomas Healy, in marked progress toward winter validation, uh, toward uh, CARB, NHTSA, and uh, EPA certification uh, going into next year. The fleet trials and demos as being um, one of those uh, elements of uh, continued uh, certification and validation by the fleets. Thomas Healy gave some excellent insight on uh, what fleets expect, whether or not they take on one demo unit or whether or not they're willing to take on 50 demo units and why that could potentially be. Uh, based on what they've historically done in the past as a business and what they feel comfortable doing uh, by taking on uh, their, 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 uh, their demos. But then uh, as we approach uh, the potential for uh, scale up and, and, and mass integration with these fleets, 
how are the OEMs going to deal with that pressure? And, and that's going to be really inevitably the dam that's going to break uh, for Hylion and provide a, a momentum shift of epic proportions. I'm um, I'm going to be calm about this deal. I've been doing this a long, long time. Uh, I'm calm to the downside. I will be calm to the upside as well. You'll get the same demeanor from me when the stock is at $24 plus, when it's at $50 plus. This opportunity is just too big. There's just too big of an addressable market here at $1 trillion uh, of, of, of total overall market value. Thomas Healy talked about the turnover per year of about 300,000 units per year. And, and of course, wanting a big lion's share chunk of that turnover. Hylion doesn't need to do that. Thomas Healy knows that. Thomas Healy understands wholeheartedly that by taking on a new customer with one new truck at a time to allow them to understand the bottom line TCO benefit that we're going to talk about here and was kind of a, 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 a stem from the due diligence that was done in the Discord because people are talking right now, what is the payback uh, of the uh, Hypertruck ERX over the long haul uh, once these units are taken in, how does the fuel price fluctuation affect that give back or, or that payback, for a lack of better terms, to the fleet owner if they decide to take on this um, uh, highly on Hypertruck uh, ERX, which is their flagship product? For you guys that don't understand, there's going to be an initial uh, cost uh, in addition to what a, a, a standard diesel truck is going to cost for the technology for the ability for this uh, TCO payback that is multi-tiered. So I, I think in going through this deliberation, I, I want you guys to really understand that when I looked at the due diligence that was done, the factors that go into the Hypertruck ERX are multi-tier. In, in other words, if you're just going to look at the fuel savings in a box, which I'm going to go out on a limb and I'm going to say that fleets are more interested in fuel savings and the ability to move away from a fossil fuel dominated future more than anything. They want that more than anything. Going green, wonderful. We'll talk about the benefits that exist therein. But if you cannot reduce the cost of fuel for these fleets, what is the point? And the due diligence that was done in the Discord group and, and articulated in my private group by, by one of my patrons as well, uh, Mr. David, who's making a name for himself. He got the last question on the Dooner interview. So I really appreciate that actually being, um, being brought to bear with regard to uh, the critical mass break even on units that need to be had to cover costs uh, to the bottom line for Hylion. Um, Thomas Healy would not speculate, uh, but I, I thought the press was good enough. These are the types of things that, in all respect, need to be posed, and they've thought about this. They have CRM on this to, to understand that. It's just through a YouTube podcast. They're not going to speculate to that end, uh, but it, at least it, it goes to the churn of that particular conversation. So when we do get up to a, a, a perspective 1,500, 2,500 units per year, we can base that against that critical mass or, or break even critical mass to understand what Hylion has to do to cover costs. And we, we've already thrown out some figures uh, on what that could mean. But the diesel and fuel savings here, when we're talking about CNG, a couple things that need to be understood is the gallon and diesel equivalent, all right? That is what uh, the, the factor that needs to be taken into consideration when you're looking at taking on the Hypertruck ERX, taking on about ninety to dollars to $100,000 of extra expenditure for the technology. And this is the real shift. This is the paradigm shift in the industry in the onset cost of a diesel rig uh, being actually lower than the new technology. And I'll explain how over time, diesel actually becomes more expensive to run that unit actually in in most cases double uh, the the price on the onset of the truck whereas the hyper truck erx is completely the opposite in that curve okay so i want you to imagine a diesel truck going down the road hauling goods getting more expensive the older that unit gets okay 
The Hypertruck ERX comparatively running CNG is going to take on that initial onset cost. It's the investment in the ability for that unit actually to drive down cost the longer that you run the unit. This is the, this is the shift in thinking, okay? Where fleets have not had a choice historically, and they haven't. They have not been provided a choice. And I would go out on a limb and say this, even as important as fuel cost and savings to the bottom line, I think in a box, it would be a hard sell for industry to take on the initial cost uh, in, in taking on the CNG Hypertruck ERX unit. It would be difficult if the sell was singularly the fuel savings over time. I believe it can be done because I believe it is the flagship reason that fleets are looking. If you can affect their bottom line, it doesn't matter about anything else. It doesn't matter about some of the other things that we're going to talk about, but I'm going to drive it home in a way that you'll understand that fuel cost is huge. All right. Fuel cost is huge. And we know that the average burn rate per gallon is about 30,000 on the high end of burn rate. Okay. So at 30,000 30, gallons of burn rate, now this is just fuel to fuel comparison. You're taking a, a, a gallon equivalent of a compressed natural gas in this particular case, and you're comparing it with the one gallon of diesel, how those two will compare over time. All right. Right now, diesel is a, a couple bucks more. So we look at the disparity between the high cost of diesel right now and actually the elevated cost of, um, of, of compressed natural gas. Now, I want to note that the figures that were used were actually higher uh, to, to drive home the point than what is actually going on right now in the marketplace. I also want to mention this, and this doesn't get talked about at all. Fleets are tired of being subject to the geopolitical tensions, uh, the hiccup in supply chain, uh, infrastructure problems, tribal influences, whatever it is that can, 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 can draw down or increase the price of diesel at any given time. The, the flex and range from its median price for diesel ranges from 65% above its median price. And that's due to infrastructure strains, transportation strains, geopolitical risk, some of the tribal acknowledgements, and even some of the domestic political uh, 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 legislation that's put forward that are either building pipelines or they're putting pause to pipeline, thus affecting the price of diesel based on the supply and the demand of the commodity. Okay. Now, when you look at CNG, it actually ranges at about half of that to its median price. This is huge. When you're looking at predictive statistics, it's very, very difficult to predict for those events that could just throw the cost of diesel into a tailspin and drive that cost up when those figures were not accounted for in the previous year. When you're looking to determine how many new trucks you take on, how, how many new drivers you take on, how much you put toward uh, research and development, and all of your business plannings are contingent upon the what if. This is very, very difficult when we're looking at the diesel because the range of price fluctuations makes it very, very difficult to make those predictions. Where with CNG, it's so much less volatile and so much more predictable on the production of the gas itself, the transportation of the gas itself, and the demand over that specific gas. Okay, the range of fluctuation is so much more predictable. And that's why I think being so bullish on compressed natural gas right here with its existing infrastructure is a key component to this. All right. Now, the payback on the 90 to 100 thousand dollars was estimated at about 14 months, just a little over a year. Okay. You could come up with bearish thesis on this, you could come up with bullish thesis. I'm going to give you my perspective. This is insane. This is insanely good. Okay. This is why I'm so excited about coming on and talking about Hylion. I devote part of my day on Sunday to come on after I've worked out, after I've got groceries to come on and talk about Hylion because this is incredibly important. You are talking about a 14-month payback to 
render or recoup that ninety to one hundred thousand dollars of additional equipment. Now, after that twelve to fourteen months, just a little over a year of payback, now you're talking about the exact same price that you would have paid for a diesel truck on the onset. Okay, this is where it gets really, really interesting. When you're talking about the potential for only burning twenty thousand gallons per year the payback could range to about 21 months, okay? So anywhere from about 14 months to about 21 months, we're talking about a payback to the bottom line TCO, all right? This is why when you look at this and companies and fleets are gonna sit back and say, whoa, 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 you want me to pony up an additional 90 to $100,000 of payback just, just, to, just to recoup my investment? What is the guarantee that we reach that seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years of payback, okay? This is where the fleet demos and the uh, validation internally is really going to pay off. And I think this is where the transition between the uh, projected uh, statistics or payback are going to really, be, really be um, the, the validation piece for Hylion. Okay, this is where that break even piece and the curve actually starts to go up to where the more you actually run the Hypertruck ERX, the more it pays back its fleet owners times the number of units that they have out there in service. Okay, now remember, they're running these units with a much more predictable price of fuel to the bottom line. Okay, how valuable is that to the business? Well, it's difficult to quantify, okay? But it does go into the fuel discussion. And I found like it was something that was missed a little bit in cross comparison the diesel equivalent CNG to the gallon of diesel uh, when looking at just the specific cost savings in putting that into service and running it out a number of months into the future to understand how many months of payback would it take to recoup that initial investment, okay? Very important for investors and folks that follow the Hylion story and the EV space as a whole to understand that there is going to be an upfront onset cost to buy the technology, okay? These trucks are advanced. If you understand anything about the systems that are going into this Hypertruck ERX, the onboard uh, system and, and monitoring of the system that goes in, the regenerative braking, you're paying for all the benefits of every single road mile that's driven. You're driving that Cadillac. You're not driving the standard uh, diesel truck that rolls down the road, making all kinds of noise, making all kinds of aromas. Okay. Duner talked about this on the live stream uh, at the interview that he had with Thomas Healy. Driving diesel is, is just an experience. And it's almost an addicting experience in that, you know, the transition to something so new like this is really going to take some getting used to. And I think this is why the fleet demo and, and really the, that's why they're so excited about getting these demos completed and in the hands of the Hypertruck ERX, because they know that based on the feedback that they've received during the ride and drives, that that should duplicate itself once in the hands of the fleets out there. In other words, experienced drivers, new drivers alike, are going to get behind the wheel of the Hypertruck ERX and actually get to experience the, 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 the total experience all at once. They don't have to just hear about it. They don't have to have somebody in the front office telling the driver who's been driving for 20 years that, hey, this is going to be a good thing for you. No, they get to experience it themselves. And that's another thing that came out of the What the Truck uh, interview that was super, super important. Uh, is something that I've been talking about for a long, long time, and that's the aesthetics of the truck. Very, very important to understand that fleets don't have to change a thing. The only thing that they're looking to incorporate is all the benefits of that truck increasing in value the more that it's run. This is scary. If you sit back and you think about the ability for the payback happening within 14 months, as little as, depending on how much they run the unit, uh, and as much as maybe 21 months, so just shy of two years on the payback side of the house, right? Now, all that time, 
they're getting to go green. And we're talking about some of the uh, uh, um, additional benefits in just a second. But think about that payback over the next five years of burning an estimated 30,000 gallons of now the fuel of choice, C and G, more predictable over time. And that unit actually paying back the bottom line for the company. The more that truck runs, the more bottom line TCO benefit to the company times the number of units that are within the fleet. It, it's a no brainer, guys. It's very, very interesting. And for you guys that are finding your way to the highly on opportunity uh, for the first time, we try to break down these concepts so you really understand holistically. I really want you to understand that looking at this in the acute, you can justify the bottom line savings over the long term by just looking at fuel in a box, but you have to look at it holistically when we're talking about the entire highly on experience. Fuel, it's the only one that drives it. And some of the competitors like Nikola specifically cannot hold a candle to the uh, gallon of, ga of, of diesel equivalent, and you're talking about the hydrogen fuel cell uh, equivalent to what they can do. And they fall short on a lot of additional categories that I'm gonna talk about, all right? So think about the Hypertruck ERX. Once that initial payback is complete, that initial investment is complete, over the course of, let's just call it two years. I said 21 months on the estimate. Let's just say that the first two years are spent paying back that initial investment on the onset that is not considering any type of, of government incentive. That is not talking about any type of state mandated incentive. And that's not talking about any type of local incentives that could be made available to these fleets to help on that initial onset uh, uh, cost to purchase the technology and, and make that leap of faith with a Hylion and the powertrain solution of choice, okay? It's not taking into consideration any of that. It's actually stating that 100% of the burden is going to be put on those fleets to incur that initial onset cost up front. Within 24 months, it's paid off. And then for the next, let's just say five years, okay? Let's just say it meets that seven-year uh, run rate uh, for driving that bottom line TCO, you're talking about five additional years of running that unit and having all of that cost savings to the bottom line. That That's insane. That we're talking about tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars of fuel savings per unit, per uh, 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 number of units within the fleet. So very, very exciting stuff. That's fuel in a nutshell. There is no more important topic in my estimation. I'm not a trucker um, and I'm not an expert in the trucking fleet itself, but talking to people, having a lot of people that are running trucks in my community who uh, enjoy this discussion. Um, they may be pro or con on this particular topic. They don't believe in global warming, whatever it is, whatever side of the political aisle you are on, no problem. I'm apolitical. So um, I have beliefs on one side and the other. That's what makes me independent in my thought. Um, I don't prescribe to thinking one way or the other. But when you're looking at fuel, fuel, in my assessment and my uh, uh, attempt to strike up dialogue within the investor community with this company, there is no bigger discussion to have than fuel. No bigger discussion than fuel, okay? I want you guys to think about the availability of said fuel. I want you to think about the um, uh, gallon of diesel equivalent when comparing the two units of measure, okay? And on the onset, you have to think about comparing those two and putting all the data that we know about what diesel will turn back over the long haul and become more expensive as it runs, as opposed to putting CNG into that on the onset to get that payback. And then that payback actually increases the value of that rig to the bottom line over time. It's one curve that goes down and one curve that goes up. It's amazing. You wonder why I'm so bullish on this company. It's a no brainer. It's a, it's easy investment. It's an easy investment to make. It polishes my conviction every single time I look at this and my conviction has never wavered on the company. Never. Second thing I want to discuss here, we've got fuel out of the way. If you can sit across from the fleets and say, 
I can sell you on the fuel. The fuel alone is enough. Well, fleets are going to say, well, what's the performance? What's the range? Um, can I, these are batteries. Um, they're obviously not going to haul as much as diesel, right? And if you don't have an answer for that, you will be asked to leave the room. You will. And I would go far, so far as to suggest this. If fleets can't hear something in addition to the fuel savings, I think as a standalone, the fuel savings has the best potential to sell fleets on a potential solution, irrespective of any of the other benefits that I'm going to talk about. It has the best chance. But fleets out there, remember, have been driving uh, diesel for a long, long time. And they have been provided data and analytics that are predictable to the extent, and they have been provided durability statistics, okay? And they have been provided efficiency. In other words, they have a pretty good idea of what type of service they're going to get out of that diesel rig over the seven to 10 year life cycle of that rig. Okay. So if you're going to come to the table and your only argument is fuel savings, fuel savings, fuel savings, you're probably going to have a more difficult time. Highly on knows this. And they're holistically selling these rigs. They are holistically selling these rigs. And if you don't believe me, look in the investor presentation, the original one that gets all the scrutiny. They used payload as a, a measure of, um, of, of bottom line payback to, uh, to fleets, okay? Think about this for a second. If a company can haul more freight and they can haul more weight, doesn't that mean that the delivery of the uh, net deliverables goes up, therefore producing more of a bottom line to the, this, the companies that, that run these trucks? Payload is key. Horsepower increases. The ability to carry more freight per trip is huge. And I want you guys to think about this. If the comparison was one gallon burned to one gallon burned, I would say yes, and I would concede. That's a great comparison for Hylion. But what if by nature of creating more horsepower and torque for that truck that they can pay more payload and they can make more money by hauling more, and they can go a greater distance in hauling that, that payload than they can with diesel. You're talking about a triple benefit there. You're talking about three times the benefit if, in fact, they're looking at this solution and they can haul more based on the horsepower. And with the 1,000 miles of Hypertruck ERX range, remember, the truck is charging itself as it's going down the road. So... The next benefit that I'm going to talk about with Hylion is that downtime is negligible. The downtime that Thomas Healy talked about on the interview, I believe, was that the seven minutes of charge time or so, which Dexter with Drive Mix Game has been so nice to, uh, to provide some, uh, um, some insight on fueling, that was extremely bullish for me because I looked at it and I was like, how much dime, downtime does this truck actually take to fuel the rig up? Uh, before it can get back out there on the road. The road, the truck is not making money unless it is on the road. And this is something that gets missed all the time, okay? They were talking about this really pie-in-the-sky idea of hydrogen, okay? And somehow we're hoping, I guess, that the cost of this hydrogen comes down. But what we miss here is the downtime. And it was mentioned that a, a fueling evolution with hydrogen is 45 minutes, you're, you're talking about six times per fueling, six times what it takes to fuel a CNG application and a diesel application to sit there on the side of the road and wait for this fueling evolution to complete. The truck is not making money. It's downtime to the bottom line that is a net expenditure to the company to incur that downtime and continue to pay that truck driver one hour to sit there and fuel that rig, as opposed to the seven minutes of downtime that it takes to uh, fuel the uh, hyper truck ERX, get it back out on the road and have it 
have that capability to extend its own range as it rolls down the, the freeway. This is something that gets holistically missed. So yes, fuel is great as a cost savings, but if you can get more distance out of that gallon and you can get more payload out of that, that seems to me to be a trifecta of benefit. And it's easy to miss in that investor presentation that was rolled out a couple of years ago, but it's there, it's there. They took that payload increase as a, a factor to, uh, to, to, to come to fleets and say, look, you, you can actually haul more, not less. You're kidding me. I can haul more? I, I would think that a battery truck, a battery electric drivetrain would actually lose horsepower. You know, it's hard to conceptualize uh, the new technology actually being better than what has been proven to work through the diesel application in durability and payload capacity. I love diesel engines. I, I used to tow on one in Alaska when I was a commercial fisherman. They are wonderful. You can beat those engines to no tomorrow and they keep going. You keep fuel, water, and air to them, they're good to go. Very, very durable. But you're telling me that I can put this new technology on and you can do better than that in a box. Payload and durability and distance. That's why that thousand miles of hyper truck range is so important. And that's why these fleet demos and validations are so important because they're going to get these uh, demo units in-house and they're going to start this internal validation. I, I would presume, and, and this is only comes from me on the Independent Investor Channel. This is why I do this because I get to have a voice on my specific opinion. But additional payload added from the Hylion solution and additional range or in other words, miles that were able to be uh, uh, traveled as opposed to diesel, okay? You've got the diesel miles traveled and then the Hypertruck ERX miles that are traveled. If those miles are greater and the payload is greater, what you're going to see is these companies on their uh, quarterly reports, their quarterly earnings reports, talking about and mentioning Hylion as the, the determinant solution that drove that TCO on the bottom line. You want to talk about a stock price that's going to be recessed at that point? I think not. I think not. If it's going to continue to be recessed, then I'll, I'll continue to buy the, the stock at these anemic levels because the stock market just does not get it. It does not get it. Neither do investors because 99% of investors out there make their decisions based on looking at the stock price, looking at the chart and saying, wow, it's gone down a lot. Therefore, I'm going to make my decision not to buy at these levels. It's the complete reverse of the application that you should take on in making your stock purchase decisions. It's just that simple. Okay. Now, downtime, we touched on a little bit. How do we quantify downtime? It's, it's very difficult. The only thing that we have to look at is the projected fueling times compared to the industry. And this is why I don't understand why Nicola Bowles don't scrutinize this very fact. It's as if they just want to conveniently ignore the fact that when they pull over, there is a certain amount of downtime. Tell me what that downtime is, okay? Hylion and HylionHoldings.com and, and Hylion and the crew have been very, very open about their ability to make power as the vehicle goes down the road, as opposed to just the old onus, fill with diesel, burn diesel down to E, pull over, fill it up again, burn to E, rinse and repeat. On its most granular level, Hylion is looking to take that and turn it on its ear to, 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 to maximize those fueling evolutions. Now you might say, Ryan, well, if it takes them a half hour, isn't it worth it? Yeah, it is. But it doesn't take a half hour to fill up the CNG tanks to get back out on the road and continue to drive that TCO benefit. If I had to sit across from a fleet and say, look, with everything that I've talked about, you're going to increase your payload. You're going to increase your range. If you're, you're also going to have your fuel savings per year as the unit drives and becomes more of an established unit in your fleet. But if I have to sit here and tell you that you have to keep the driver and the unit on the side of the road subject to other trucks, this is what gets missed. 
It's as if we assume that all fueling stations are just nice and empty and that they roll out a red carpet for every semi-truck that rolls in there. No, there's other truckers that need the ability to fuel as well. How does that speak to congestion? How does that speak to limiting congestion for the Hylion solutions that are always out on the road hauling freight? That's what they're doing. Are we putting these solutions in place to sit in a, a six truck line to wait for their opportunity for their 45 minutes to put hydrogen fuel cell in their tank? If they can even find a station out there with hydrogen fuel cell that's available. How much of a bottleneck is going to be created by this new infrastructure and the same fleets identifying that one fueling station along a specific route? How popular do you think that specific stop is going to be for those routes? Do you think that these fleets are really going to incur their units to a bottleneck at that one fueling station with a line that backs up 10 miles down the highway while they're waiting to incur this 45 minutes that doesn't incur any scrutiny at all? I just said that you're going to take 10 hours to do that fueling because there are other trucks on the road thinking the same thing. Okay. Downtime. Very, very difficult to quantify. But if you're looking to build a bullish conviction or a bullish thesis on this company, it becomes very, very clear and very, very evident that from the onset, the very truth that was put forward with Hylion is Thomas Healy looked at this and said, hey, we've got existing infrastructure of around 729 fueling stations. And you think, well, that's great. They just said that. No, 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 no. They're partnered with American Natural Gas. Okay, there is a grand vision here to provide those credits to those uh, fleets that are willing to fly the Hylion flag and are willing to uh, enjoy the infrastructure that's already in place by American natural gas. Okay, 729 spread out. If there's other fleets that are looking to uh, fuel their trucks along a specific route, it's very, very important for that infrastructure to be in place. Thomas Healy has said this many, many times, and I don't think Hylion obviously doesn't get any credit for it, but this is a key. This is a key differentiator between Hylion and the other solutions out there. And I don't mean to downplay the other solutions. I don't. I want them to succeed for the good of the space. If it's better for the planet, I'm all about it, okay? But the sheer reality is to, to, to ignore the downtime that is anticipated per unit, per fleet, per other opportunities for fueling at these limited fueling opportunities is, is naive. It's naive. And it's living in a pipe dream. It's hoping that these things come to fruition. It's hoping that that infrastructure comes to play. It's hoping that those fueling availabilities will be there for my fleets when I buy the Nicola Trey vehicle, right? And a lot of people would say, well, Hylion is a pipe dream. Not in the least, not in the least. You mark my word over the next year and a half, 18 months, okay, of fleet demo and validation of certi critical certification, the stock should double once the certification is done. It's just that simple. The stocks, the uh, uh, unit uh, demo and certification means that those units are, are eligible for reverse breakdown, and those can be the, uh, built, packaged, and sent to the OEMs for install off of the line. That's the money ticket right there. But as far as value with the company, they now have been deemed and certified a viable solution to enjoy all of the things that I'm talking about here to be put into the rigors of over the road class eight uh, uh, transit for fleets. Fleets are going to be given options. Is there fuel along routes? Well, this route up here, we've got to maintain the diesel. Okay. But it gives that optionality that I talk about so often as being a critical piece to this puzzle. Okay. If they can't do away with diesel or they can't supplement that diesel route with the hybrid EX product, yeah, I said it, 
that's exactly what's going on is that those routes can be supplemented with the diesel hybrid EX to add that additional horsepower and give at least a little bit of bottom line savings and an introduction to electrification, as opposed to going full electric with either C and G and dare I say the X factor. The X factor in this whole thing is RNG. The X factor is RNG, okay? Now, CNG is going to be that capability of enjoying existing infrastructure. RNG is going to be piped through existing infrastructure, and the hypertruck is going to be able to run off of that RNG. Now, if they can't do away with all of their diesel routes, it's going to be imperative to that carbon emission score and the social governance score that investors nowadays, it's a big deal. It's a big deal. If you've got shareholders that are saying, hey, maybe it's time for this green uh, initiative to maybe take hold a little bit, it's super important, okay? It's a perfect segue into the green opportunity here. Hylion's a green company, the ability to fly the flag of green, wonderful. Um, I, I, I take great pride in looking at these companies like Hylion that are looking to provide these solutions across the globe to make the planet a better place, okay? What type of quantifiable benefit do we have, okay? When you take all of the aforementioned factors, it's driving TCO. Does green in and of itself drive TCO? I would contend no, it doesn't, it doesn't. Now, could there be some uh, um, indirect benefits of going green, taking on more customers that demand uh, that going of green, therefore increasing your customer base and being able to appeal to a, a wider audience? Of course, that's the reality of it. But I, I, I really think there's more of, of, a, of, a, of an optics benefit uh, to going green for these companies. Uh, I think Detmar and uh, Anheuser-Busch both were in the top 10, I believe, uh, for uh, environmental governance scores uh, with their companies. They are hungry and they are on the forefront and they're leading the charge. You don't think that that somehow provides uh, some level of uh, across the board uh, competitive uh, environment with regard to the race to green? I believe that it does. I certainly do. Do you want to be that fleet that's left in the cold, that's continuing to run on a diesel dominated future? Now you can get away with it. Five years down the line, I think it may be a little bit more imperative for you to stop keeping your head in the sand and ignoring what you've been able to ignore for many, many decades. And that is put plain and simple. There has not been a solution that could provide the specific TCO that I am talking about. Really? You can haul more? Yeah. You can limit downtime. Yeah. You can do all these things and you can also go green. Okay. That's all I'm going to say about the green. It's a difficult one to quantify, but when you're talking about the holistic picture here, Thomas Healy talks about the holistic picture and the picture is answered in one very simple question. What type of reception are you getting from fleets? It's overwhelming. It's overwhelming. They know electrification is coming, right? They're excited about this initiative. And I would go out on a limb again and, and just, again, give you my commentary on this particular um, uh, thing. If I felt for a second that fleets didn't want to change, then I wouldn't have put such a large position on Hylion. Mm -hmm. But I believe based on everything that I have researched, based on infrastructure that is coming available, advances in technology, that the time is now. The time is now. And I believe that these fleets are willing to change. I could be wrong on this. I could be wrong. I don't believe I am. Um, I'm using the best application in my insights to provide you guys the best information that I possibly can. And I believe that the time is now. And I'll tell you what, if I'm wrong, it, it sure feels good to be on the right side of history and asking these questions to say, look, is there opportunity for improvement? Um, do we need to improve? Um, is trucking the number one polluter on the earth? Yes, yes, it is. It's a hell of a black eye to have in an industry that is absolutely critical to the movement of our goods in the over the road trucking space. It's absolutely critical, but what a black eye to have and absolutely a bullseye to have in an area of improvement. And 
it, it's lovely for me to hear uh, chief technical officers and upper executives and boards of directors on all of the major Fortune 500 companies all talking about this same thing. You think you want to be that CEO out there that wants to go right while everybody else is going left? Oh, I don't know. I think that's an awful dangerous position and a way to get your ass voted out. If you're going to stand up and say, you know what, um, this is all great and plenty, but I don't believe in any of this. I don't believe that we have an obligation uh, for a better planet. I don't believe we as a company have any type of obligation to the planet whatsoever to take a look at our own internal processes and look for areas of improvement. And there's going to be companies and people understand that by nature of that internal review, there's going to be sections of the business that cannot be improved upon. That's just the nature of the business. But if they're doing due diligence and they're exercising those opportunities and identifying those opportunities where it's worth the chance, it's worth the chance. You start to look at the landscape and say, what are those solutions out there that can best fit in my business to help me identify these uh, problem areas within the company that we can improve upon our green governance score, okay? Driver experience, huge. We've talked about this before. Driver experience, how does that drive the bottom line? Well, if you can't find drivers to drive the trucks, does that create a problem? If you cannot provide or you're paying out so much in medical benefits or disability of 25 years getting your butt kicked in the cockpit of one of these trucks over the course of your life, lawsuits, litigation, if you cannot provide a good driver experience, what are we talking about here? If you cannot sell this opportunity to those uh, fleets out there and go to especially those younger drivers that don't know any different, that get in, in the, the cab of a hyper truck ERX and say, this is incredible. I love driving. And I could see myself driving this for the long term. It's comfortable. It's efficient. And, and dare I say, it's good for the government. Hold on a second. You mean to tell me that the more I drive this vehicle, I'm not saying be unsafe. I'm saying that the more miles that I put over the road in transporting goods for the good of the order, the better it is for the planet. You're telling me that that's not a powerful uh, talking point. That's not my opinion. That's actually coming from one of the writer reps that's part of the Highly on Innovation Council. That is a very, very powerful tool in looking at this thing holistically, okay? Fuel savings, great to the bottom line. But if you can't retain good talent and you can't attract good talent and you can't maybe even take that three-decade driver and say, what do you think? And have them admit that this is, this is a game changer. These are some of the things that have been provided via feedback on the ride and drive experience. And um, that, that is absolutely key when looking at the holistic uh, application here with the company. I said I wasn't going to talk about the stock on today's offering. But when I'm looking to drive a disconnect between those two and provide value for the would-be independent investor audience, this is the disconnect that I look to drive home. It just doesn't make sense. Where companies will go up forever because it doesn't make sense, this is one of those situations where in the short term, for an undetermined amount of time, we're going to have to incur pain. I don't even know what that means anymore. Me personally, I don't care. Okay, I just don't care. The stock is going to go up, it's going to go down, whatever it's going to do, it does not matter. Because these are the types of things that need to be enjoyed by the fleets. And we're just not quite there. And when we get there, it's going to be game on, game on. If we're looking at the fleets in a box, and you say, what incentive, what motivation do the fleets have, yada, yada, I personally believe that the fleets want to change. I do. I, I'm one of those fellas that live on this earth, and I believe that most people are good people, especially when we're talking about our businessmen and women who represent such an amazing uh, logistics chain that we have here in our over-the-road trucking. I think that these are amazing, hardworking people from the drivers to the front office, to the logistics people, to the freight forwarders, all of them, phenomenal people phenomenal people. And I think they want to do good. Here's the piece that doesn't get talked about enough. And I wish we would talk about it enough more. Thomas Healy mentions this quite often. Uh, and, and it's, it's always falls on deaf ears, right? Um, the stock seemingly can do no right. 
But what is it that the customers that these fleets are serving say about flying the flag or collaborating with or partnering with those companies who, in the eyes of their customers, are not doing due diligence in looking to achieve a greener future? Ever think about that, right? Customers serve different customers, okay? I've seen uh, Warner trucks out there driving for Dollar General. I've seen Penske driving for, you know, multiple different companies out there. Everybody drives for, for others. Penske, rental truck, Schneider, pulling for this company over here. They all pull for different companies. I'm by no means an expert on this topic, but the customers themselves, if they rely on the logistics companies to do that, you don't think that there's a little bit of pressure or a lot of pressure for those companies to explore these opportunities. If you don't think so, you need to wake up to this opportunity because that pressure is real and they are absolutely looking at this landscape right now. Thomas Healy mentioned this. He said, if we had the trucks right now, we would be selling them. The reality is we just don't. We wish we did. Uh, we don't. He alluded to the sales team, and I wasn't sure how true this was. I'm not sure if he was kind of making light of it or making a joke, but if you were to go talk to the sales team right now, they would say, give me something to sell. I found that to be a very, very telling takeaway from the What the Truck interview. I, I thought that was pretty, interview, uh, pretty interesting, and he could have been speaking tongue-in-cheek. I'm not really sure if I believe that. I think there might be an undertone to say, look, if we didn't have the supply chain issues... And you came to public markets and everything was conducive to meeting timelines and having the ability for Peterbilt to say, look, we're really hungry. Get us the powertrain right now. We can install these things and we can sell them now. I believe that they would. I really do. So in the grand scheme of things, when we're talking about a, a, a year or a year and a half, in the grand scheme of things, it's not going to matter. Um, we're talking about um, a, a finite amount of time in what is going to be a multi-year company going forward, all right? But the customer demand is worth noting here in the holistic approach when we're talking about the bottom line TCO. It's something that we're going to continue to revolve around in our due diligence, in understanding the excitement that's going to go into this eventual momentum shift with the company. It's inevitable going to happen. I'm 100% convinced on this. 100%. You cannot have an opportunity like this, a good a company as this is, as good a management as this is, as good a board of governance as this has, as good of an idea at a time and place than this that can drive the TCO that I've just spent 45 minutes talking about with you guys and not have a momentum shift. And when it happens, it's going to be furious. Okay. And I'll sit back and calmly continue to deliver the message. I've said many, many times that I would stop or digress with my highly on message. Nothing stops. Uh, I'm not stopping on this project. I don't care where the stock is. I don't care where it goes. I will continue to foot stomp this until I feel like it's time to let it go. And we're providing the most value right now. There's a few other YouTubers out there that I just appreciate the heck out of their efforts they're doing a great, great job, okay? And to put yourself on an island and talk about this conviction and talk about these, this due diligence that I know has been completed, it really speaks to the value that exists and is not being recognized by the market at the current juncture. Last thing I'll mention here is social governance. Two, two elements to social government governance that I talk about. With each unit that's put into the fleets, uh, from from Hylion, for example, okay, it gives them the ability to either with CNG or more importantly the X factor with RNG reduce their carbon emission score and even maybe dare I say go to net negative of 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 neutral, okay, in their application. Now that governance score, that negative integer, that can move to other areas of the total overall score. Because like I said, there's going to be areas of the company that just cannot be reduced with regard to the waste that gen that's generated by some of these multi-billion dollar companies. These, they're enormous. The, the waste that's generated is enormous. So the social governance and resp responsibility that they have is multifaceted, okay? Transportation is a big piece to that. 
in that every unit that runs down the road that is reliant upon a diesel dominated future just adds to that carbon emissions footprint score that each of these companies in all of my readings are looking to reduce what solution out there has that ability to reduce that carbon emission score and that social governance piece for, for companies highly on absolutely does through their hyper truck ERX. The last thing I'll mention is from the investor sentiment piece. Doesn't it feel good to invest in these companies with these social governance scores? People are investing on this stuff right now. I will go so far as to say that people look not to invest in those companies that they feel like are uh, circumventing or naive to this topic of uh, uh, taking care of the planet, reducing carbon footprint, looking at their logistics from cradle to grave, and understanding those areas of improvement that they can take on to reduce their carbon footprint. Guys, I appreciate you tuning into the message. I want to make sure and drive this conversation every single week. Like I said uh, in the making of this video, I'm not going anywhere. I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to continue to foot stomp this. I just love doing this project. I absolutely love it. A little bit of jab in the side. A uh, little bit of um, sweet justice, I guess, having David's uh, question picked up on the last, talking about that critical mass and break even for cost of coverage of uh, uh, of, of uh, running the business at Hylion. A um, little bit of a jab. I left 15 questions at Twitter. I don't know. Maybe nobody saw my questions. I find that hard to believe. No problem. The Independent Investor Channel represents my opportunity to have my voice, okay? My singular opinion. Uh, my uh, addressal of consensus on both sides of the house. Um, I've received criticism uh, on my constructive criticism of Hylion. I will not, I will not apologize. Um, I am a convicted bull on the company. I own shares in the company. And I come on to share the story of how I see this uh, story developing over the coming 12 on the low end and especially 18 months as these critical milestones are met. Certification, fleet demo and trial, winter validation, and eventually mass scale up with the help of the OEMs going forward. That momentum shift is inevitable. The question is, when is that uh, inevitable momentum shift going to happen? Comments in the section. Subscribe to the message if you enjoy what's coming through. Share this message with anybody out there that you know is looking to get in on what I would consider to be a ground floor. Uh, stocks don't price against cash very often. We've got this right now with about $600 million of cash and equivalents in the bank ready to make this business plan a reality over the coming 18 months. The clock is ticking. The clock is ticking. And that momentum shift, like I said, is inevitable. Thank you so much for tuning into the message and good luck in your investment future.